Welcome back, uh, dreamy men and women. So for you, it's probably been a couple of days or a couple of weeks before I release, uh, you know, this this next episode of the Aikido philosophy and history. Uh, or unless it's been already released and you're just connecting the two. But anyway, for me, it's been only a few minutes. I just recorded the first session about Aikido, its history and Osensi and his history. But now let's look at the main subject of the whole controversy of the philosophy. So now that you know kind of the background of Mori Yoshiba and, and how he came to come to the conclusion that Aikido needs to be created, like a martial art which is seeking peace needs to be created, uh, let's look at deeper the philosophy and the whole controversy of why I feel the Aikido world actually fails to deliver that philosophy. So. Uh, I mentioned to you that I will explain a bit deeper the perspective of Osensei, uh, the whole unity of um, what the Aikido idea of that we're all one family means and what it implies to, to it as martial art. Uh, because Osensei, the founder of Aikido, he would often speak and say that we are all one family, we all come from the same source, and that was very related to his spiritual uh, kind of opening up, enlightenment, if you, if, you, if you want to say, if you call it that, if you want to call it that, of his perception that we're all one, kind of that Zen state. Uh, I've, uh, I'll just mention it briefly here, but I went down that road, you know, I explored that enlightenment thing and so on. There's a whole video about that. I call it, I called it enlightenment is not, uh, is not what you think. Uh, you can watch it there if you want more details, but I'm familiar with that subject uh, and it's best perceived and understood through directly experiencing that kind of open state. Uh, but there's also a very good way of theoretically explaining it, of what that uh, that state is. And um, the way to explain it, uh, there's a great, great story, kind of a simple, beautiful story to portray that message. Uh, and the story, for some reason, it's called the egg story. I can't you know exactly remember why. And I'll just give you a brief version of it, but look it up online. It's, it's definitely a story worth listening to. Uh, but the story goes that a person dies and uh, he goes to this heaven place or whatever. And uh, he meets this godly being and they have a conversation. And the guy who just died says, so where am I? And the, uh, the godly being says, you're in this transitional state. And uh, he says, so does that mean I'm going to move on to the next life, like reincarnate? And he's the godly being. He's like, yeah, kind of, but not really. He's like, what do you mean? Well, he's like, you're not going to continue on in the same time. Like, you're not going to go to the next life after this, your death. You're just going to move at a different life. And he's like, so I'm going to exist at the same time. And he's like, the godly being is like, yeah. So, so is that like, he's like, is it the first time I'm doing it? And he's like, the godly being is like, no, actually, it's been a long, it's like you're doing this for a while. So the guy's like, so damn, I've been all those people that I loved. Actually, I, I, I was loving myself. I was, I was them. And he's like, yep. And he's like, so that means all the people I hit are, were myself as well. And the other guys, the God, the being's like, yep. And he's like, so I was Hitler. It's like, yep. So I was Jesus. Yep. And then, and then that's kind of the, the whole story. And I think it's a beautiful way of understanding that philosophy of we are all one. You know, that if you imagine yourself going up in the same background as someone else, you know, you'd have the exact same conditions, parents and intelligence and so on and so forth, you would probably end up making those same decisions. And so, so that whole notion of the X story kind of gives you a perspective that, that you, there's, there's a great chance that, you know, the other person is very much like you. You just have different... Uh, opportunities and then what would you do with that person if you were actually that person like what how would you want to act with that person if you were that particular person in that misfortune if you give an example you know, if you meet someone misfortunate and it's easy to kind of disassociate yourself and think you know oh it's his trouble it's his problem it's his you know bad i don't care about it my life is my life but in this philosophy if you imagine that you would die and you would actually live his life and you ask, so what would I want to do for him if I was him? It's kind of a deep you know, rabbit hole, but, but that's actually kind of the essential way to explain what the Aikido philosophy is, in my understanding. And that's what kind of Osensi, the founder of Aikido, that's what he was trying to portray. 
uh, he had that realization that we're all one, that we're all connected, and he asked the question, so how do I create a martial art which respects that, which honors that? And from what I understand, his, his uh, intention was to create, and what he kind of aimed to do, and what kind of Aikido looks like, he aimed to uh, create Aikido in this way where it's very flowing, very connected, there's, you know, there's few punches, like the, the further he went, you could kind of see that he would reduce the, the punches and and the kind of techniques which are really damaging. That 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 seems like that was the direction he was heading, and he was making it softer and softer. Uh, and and it kind of sounds cool. It sounds cool because it seems like oh, so that would be, and that's what kind of Aikido dubs itself as, as a martial art which doesn't hurt the other person who's attacking you. So, you know, that would be great for, for example, um, security guards or policemen, or if you want to sustain someone who's a close family member to you, like, you know, somebody's drunk in a party and getting trouble and you don't want to hurt them because, you know, he's like your, your cousin or whatever, but you need to sustain him somehow. Uh, so the, I, the ideal that Aikido was aiming for would be great in those situations. You know, you, you deal with the person without hurting him. And you're respecting that we're all one, and, and, and if you would that, if you would be that person, that's the way you would want to probably be handled. Now the reality, unfortunately, is different. And while let's say even if Osensi was able to do that because he was a talented martial artist, and maybe his top students were able to do that, there are stories that you know they would deal with conflicts efficiently. At the same time. Historically, most of Osensi's students were achieved martial artists in other martial arts already. Most of them were high-level judoka or karateka. And since he was so famous, they would go to him and they would study with him and they would take on the aspect of Aikido, but they knew how to handle themselves. Like there's a story of one of the main, most talented students of, of Osensi, Koichi Tohei who later went on to create this kind of spiritual style of his own. But I think he was really high level judoka. And there's a story where I believe a wrestler, like a Western wrestler, comes and challenges Koichi Tohei. And uh, actually, I think he challenges the school, you know, and says, you know, prove me that works. And Osensei is already old, so he doesn't take it on himself. And he says, Koichi, go take care of it. And he deals with this high level Western wrestler he kind of, uh, he, he, he's able to win against him, but but I don't think it came just from Aikido. I think it's, personally, I think it came mainly from, you know, his judo background. And also to Aikido, especially in, in, in that kind of period, there was a while when Aikido or Sensei's dojo was called Oni Dojo, I think that's the Japanese term, or the Demon Dojo, because they would have like bloody knees and because of sitting on the knees all the time so much, and they would train like like five times per day. The, the, the training was hardcore. They were not like light and easy with each other, and especially because if you look at the first episode where you know the history of Aikido, a lot of the young Japanese men, they actually wanted to kind of, they felt they lost their honor because Japan lost in the war, and they wanted to kind of win that back. So they were really like, you know, aggressive and wanting to become powerful warriors. That's kind of one of the take where how you look which you can see when you look at the story. So, and uh, Osensi himself, he was a badass in his youth. And I think a lot of people were inspired about that too. So basically had this culture of these young guys training like hell with the heavy martial arts background uh, beforehand. So yeah, probably they were tough warriors as much as Aikido founder himself. But the thing is, the further he went, the more lighter he, he made Aikido and the more softer and if you take, and this is kind of where I feel like Aikido is in the current day. If you take someone who just comes in into an Aikido dojo without any background in other martial arts, it's it's a whole subject, and I don't want to make this video about that. I explored it way too much in you know the martial art journey channel. But basically, to give you a summary, Aikido is trained uh, in a way where where it's uh, there's no resistance. It's a very light way of training, very cooperative. And while some Aikidoka believe that it's effective way of training, in reality, I'll just tell you a short answer, it's not. If you want to learn to fight, you need to fight. And in Aikido, there's zero fighting. 
and or or zero actually real defending it's just kind of choreography you're just repeating the same motions uh, with a partner who's letting you do them and i think the more I, the world continued to go the more aikido went into this this realm and also i believe personally that most of the aikido instructors were also challenged because um osensei's philosophy was since we're all part of the same family that it doesn't make sense to fight each other so he was kind of uh, neglecting the aspect of competition. While competition, again, to give you a brief summary, it leads to purification of technique. When you're a competition, you have two people who are really trying to overcome each other and your technique has to really work well because there are two experts dealing with, you know, an expert dealing with another expert. When there's no competition, there's no pressure testing, there's no uh, there's no uh, way for you to, there's no actually motive for you to really make your techniques work. You just kind of play around with each other and you think it works, but you never really test them with the a person who's really trying to get you, especially in a style such as an Aikido, because that competitive aspect is disregarded. And there's one particular style of Aikido which does have competition, but even then it looks kind of weird. Long story again. But then I personally think that the world of Aikido was challenged because of that. And uh, Aikido students, the main high-level students, they were left with the legacy of Morihei Shiba, very spiritual, very religious guy, believing in the mystics and so on, and believing in this world peace and having went through this long journey to come to that conclusion. And most of his students were just badass martial artists who just wanted you know, to, to be great and they wanted to learn from best. And since he was known as one of the best at the day, and so after his death, basically you could look at it that way, you have a bunch of these tough guys who know theoretically the idea of Aikido's peace and harmony and so on and so forth, and they have to portray to other people, but they're not as established as in it as Osensi was. And everyone is kind of looking at them and expecting them to know what the heck he was talking about. But the thing is, one more thing and a controversy and a difficult subject, kind of a challenge of Aikido, which sometimes is spoken of, sometimes it's, people are silent about it. But I actually had the pleasure of meeting a person who was a friend of Morihei Yoshiba, the founder. And he's a Westerner, his name is Robert Nadeau. And uh, he would tell stories about, like real life stories. He lived in Japan and, and met with Osensei many, many times at his last kind of late, late, late stage of his life. And so I would hear direct stories of what was really going on. And one of the stories really struck me was that uh, based on Robert Nadeau, uh, Osensei would sometimes go on these tangents where he would just start to talk about spirituality and kind of his religious beliefs. And he would do that for hours and hours. And he would do it instead of training. He was supposed to teach, but he would start to teach and talk about that spirituality side of things. And one thing is, first of all, Osensei was really deeply devoted to it and, and he was very, he, his way of explaining his religious beliefs was very complicated. There was, there were a lot of Shintoistic uh, theories and symbols and kind of religious beliefs and technicalities, kind of the whole mythology. If you weren't aware of, he would quote that all the time. He would use like terms like Izanagi, Izanami, the Amma, or what's that? Anyway, I forgot there's a dragon name, which he believed he became an embodiment of. Like it's a whole complicated thing. And he would talk in those uh, kind of complicated aspects and nobody would get it. Nobody would knew what he's talking about because he had, again, those, a bunch of young badasses who had no clue about spirituality or religion. And, and so sometimes Osensei would go into these tangents, which not a lot of people understood what he's talking about. That was the difficulty. If you read some of the translations, it's like, even today, it's like, what the heck he's talking about? Like there's some ideas which like, there's this small, small great, great book, Art of Peace, where some of his best ideas and most simple ideas are, are portrayed also in English. And they're beautiful. Some of them are really nice. But even then, sometimes some of them are like, what the heck is he talking about? But if you read some of the bigger books of how he spoke and, and what he spoke about, it's like, holy crap, it's, it's, a, it's a maze there. And so back to Robert Nudeau, he's sitting there and Osensei goes on a tangent and a couple of senior students are standing by the door and they see, and he witnesses that, 
Robert Nadeau witnesses that. He sees some of his, uh, some other students are kind of, you know, late to class or coming to the next class and they're heading towards the dojo and the senior students come out and say like, you know, like show him, don't come, like, you know, the guy is talking, there's gonna be no class, don't, don't waste your time. And those were, based on the story, those were senior students of Morihiro Shiba. So that shows that they weren't deeply interested, or most of them weren't deeply interested in what he was talking about. Yet now, after, you know, they're being sent to the world to spread the word of Aikido, or especially after Osensi's death, everybody's looking up to them. Everybody wants them to, to explain to them, like, what is that thing that Morihiro Shiba was talking about? And they have no clue, and they have to guess. So that's a huge challenge that I think most of them never overcame and I think most of Aikido students are still struggling with it or instructors. They're trying to make sense of what Osensi was talking about but it was it's so tough to get to the point of it and then you have the physical aspect which is an important thing to address as well because the thing is if you want to defend yourself there's almost no way to avoid violence unless you're talking your way out maybe, you know, or you're showing that you can defend yourself and this, the conflict stops. That's kind of how Moriyashiba did it a few times in his life based on the stories. But thing is, uh, without violence, it's almost impossible. And, and the, the, the irony is, even if you look at most of Aikido techniques, uh, they're potentially deadly, most of them. Like uh, Shihonage, where you turn under the arm and you throw the person to the ground. If the person doesn't know how to fall, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm putting on a video right now. If you don't know how to fall, there's a huge chance you will hit your head at, at concrete with the back of your head and you might die easily. Some of the throws as well, if you don't know how to fall, you will get injured badly. So it kind of, it's almost mind boggling. So how did Aikido people believe, or even Osensi? Now, if you question that openly, how did he believe, you know, that this is, peaceful if the techniques they're just they're if you will resist them and, and a person who will attack you will resist them you'll probably break his arms and maybe bash his head and kill him and you know you could continue on to talk about this whole bigger aspect of protection or in other words you know you're killing that person or you're injuring him for the sake of the better whole you know you're protecting him from himself but I never heard particularly more Hiroshiba talk about that himself. Now, if you're looking at the martial arts aspect of Aikido, um, like, like, or the, the aspect of protecting an attacker from himself, the best solution that I've come across for training martial arts in a devoted way for years is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Because it's a very capable martial art, which actually does have competition, but it tends to create humble individuals more often than not. And it's all about, it's a lot about choking out the person, the other person, or isolating him on the ground, which is actually kind of what Aikido aims for. But if you really want to create a peaceful outcome without hurting the other person, choking out the person is the best possible solution. Because you're not hurting him, he's passing out. And the thing is, and that's what one of my main mentors and friends and friend talks about uh, Matt Thornton, head coach of Straight Blast Gym. He, 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 he talks about this, and I, I agree with him 100%, because pain compliance is not always gonna work. If a person is on drugs or intoxicated or the adrenaline comes in, you can break his arm and he can still attack you. The body can do amazing things, but then if you choke a person out, he's out. You know, and he cannot do anything about it. So if you want to, if you want to find a martial art which is really effectively can deal, potentially can deal with a physical conflict in a peaceful way without hurting another person. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is your best take in my, in my opinion. Uh, Aikido unfortunately is not. Not that I can perceive in any way. The best thing that I think Aikido can strive for and hopefully it does create is if, 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 if someone, if the Aikido community keeps talking about that whole notion of we are one and being able to, to focusing on conflict resolution and that's what again oh, Aikido founder would, would talk about that he would say that Aikido is the way to reconcile the whole world in that way 
if you have that philosophy and somebody wants to attack you, if you're a badass fighter and you have none of that philosophy, maybe you'll just, you know, kick the crap out of that person and accidentally kill him. But let's say, hopefully, you, let's say you don't kill him, but you just kick his ass and you're like, fuck you, man. And you don't, don't give a fuck and you walk away. You don't even, you know, bother to talk with him. Although, I, honestly, I think, like, if you're a decent, good practitioner of, let's say, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, most likely you won't even just get into that fight. Because you also have the confidence. You know that you can take care of that person. And if you're realistic, you know that even if you're a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you may still get killed accidentally. Maybe there's another guy, or maybe he has a knife, or maybe, you know, you don't see... You don't, you don't see the attack coming. You're not an invincible human being. And so you don't get into the fight, but you also know you can handle yourself. With Aikido, if you know my background, you know you might know this part of the story. I trained it for more than a decade. I was an instructor of it, but I always had doubts when somebody would threaten to attack me because I knew I'm not actually, I deeply inside, I knew that I'm actually not capable of defending myself because the martial art is flawed the way it's trained. So even that, it's actually failed to do because as my friend Francisco uh, de los Cobos says, uh, I really like what, that, that phrase, if you're not capable of war, then you're not, you cannot be a real pacifist. You know, if you are being a pacifist and you're trying to find a peaceful resolution because you know that you don't have an alternative, that's not real power. You know, you're just trying to kind of get out of the situation. But if you are a badass fighter, and then you choose to not kill someone or not hurt them. And then you choose to be a pacifist, then you're a pacifist. But let me stress that again. If you don't know how to fight and you feel threatened and you're like, oh, let's not fight, let's not fight, but you're saying that because you're afraid of what the other person is gonna do if you're gonna fight him, that's not real peace. And that's one of the aspects where I feel like Kido is failing. You know, it gives that image of creating and I think that was one of the images of kind of visions of, of Sensei the founder of Aikido to create these badass fighters badass warriors who would be able to defend themselves and others but they would choose not to I mean they would choose not to hurt you know they would talk their way or they would restrain the other person and say look man you don't want to do this this is not your day there's a famous story actually and funny enough it's written oh well actually I read it written not by an Aikido guy, but it's written by an Aikido guy, one of the famous uh, Westerners who trained with Morihiroshiba in his earlier days. Which slipped my mind now. It's, it's a well-sounding name. Anyway, so he wrote the story where he was actually one of those tough young badasses who didn't care about the philosophy so much and he wanted to test his Aikido. And he was sitting in a train and there was a guy, like a drunk guy, a Japanese guy walking through the, the train aisle and just making a fuss. And he really, the, the guy, uh, he really wanted to test out his Aikido. And he felt like whenever the guy is going to come, I'm just going to bash him to pieces. But before it, the drunk guy came to him, another Japanese guy stand, stood up and, you know, went to him and kind of hugged him and said, man, come on, like, what's up? Like, do you, are you having a bad day? You know, can we talk about this? And they sat down and the drunk guy started crying. Terry Dobson, I think that's the best one. Anyway, so the guy, the guy started crying, the drunk guy started crying and apologizing and saying, we had this shitty day, like, please forgive me, I don't know what I was doing. And, and Terry Dobson, if I remember the name correctly, he thought and said to himself, no, that's Aikido. But the thing is, that guy wasn't even training Aikido, the one who made that solution. And Terry Dobson, at the day, he wanted to bash the guy to pieces while training Aikido. So you can see how, how it didn't all line up. And I think it doesn't still till today. And it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy that it doesn't. So I'm hoping that you're starting to see through this narrative in what a challenging situation the Aikido community is. That, you know, it's kind of, it has this huge promise, which is super hard to live, to make a reality, even if you're a badass martial artist, but then it has a flawed teaching mechanics and uh, it doesn't give you the tools to do it, but it expects you to do it. And then you have this narrative of a sensei who was just like, you know, in his own head, had this whole complex understanding of spirituality, which few people got. And so that's why I think Aikido is one of the main, one of the reasons why, not the only one, but one of the reasons why Aikido 
Is it a crisis these days? I believe so. Few people choose to train Aikido, especially younger guys. They, they, they perceive soon enough, especially with all the YouTube videos out there who show the flaws of Aikido, including my own, they see that Aikido doesn't give the power in reality which it's promising to give. And then they, they do want that power. And then if you're not offering the power, you cannot offer the peace. And also too, a few Aikido dojos actually talk about the peace. Not a few, but not all of them. Like there's some who just train in kind of dead patterns and expect to become enlightened somehow just on the side and it doesn't happen. There's, there's a wonderful story. Uh, there's actually a great book, Remembering Osensei, where a bunch of his senior students and close friends share short memories of him. And there's one which really stuck with me. It's where one of his senior students there, a bunch of them were walking together with Osensi, Aikido's founder. And, uh, and, and actually, when you listen to the narrative, to the story of Mori Yoshiba, he actually admitted on record quite a few times that he felt misunderstood. He felt like his students are not getting him. And, and he would kind of complain to some people, like dear people to him. He's like, I'm not able to, you know, deliver my message. And I think that was, that was reality. That was the truth. And he was a great uh, practitioner, but he wasn't a great teacher, I think. He would barely explain techniques. He was teaching in an old school way. So that's a flaw as well. But then the story goes that he was walking down the road with a bunch of his senior students. And he was saying something like along the lines of, I see people walking together with me, but when I turn back, I realize there's no one really walking with me. And the guy who was saying that story, he said initially he didn't understand what he means, but years later he understood that that's exactly what Osensi was talking about, that, that he realized, he saw that no one really is following this path that he really wants to deliver. I think partly because he failed to deliver it as, as, you know, as much as it's too bad to say, to admit. There's another story. A great one, which I mentioned, uh, it's also from the same book, so just you know, buy it and read it if you want to know more about this stuff. But basically, uh, there's, as I said, there's a myth in Aikido, which I was exposed to myself as well, like I was part of that myth, a believer, that, and that's kind of what I sense he tried to do. He tried to encode kind of the feeling of harmony and, and the Aikido philosophy through the movements, but it didn't really work out, I think. And, uh, but the, the idea was that if you train Aikido for a long enough time, just do the techniques that you will naturally kind of come to that mind, mindset of harmony and peace and realization that you're all one. The thing is, a lot of people try that and they had that, they invested in that belief and, and the story the, the guy says, he said back then when they met Osensi and looked at him, they were like, oh crap, if I train long enough and tried enough, I will be like him when I'm old. But he said, now we're in our 60s, 70s. Now we're at the age of Osensei, but we're nothing like him. We can do most of the stuff he's able to do. We don't have the same perspective. And he said, he kind of admits, he says, now I realize that we went on the wrong path. We didn't, you know, training, just training was not enough. You know, if you want to be Osensei, you have to go through that journey. And that's actually one of the parts which, which did, was, which was very dear for me from Morihei Shiba and, you know, I promised to talk about the philosophy of Aikido and actually I just went so much talking about how it fails, which is just, I guess, you know, I feel I'm a bit sensitive about that subject and I want to make sure, you know, to address that. But I also want to make sure to address the, the philosophy and there's one aspect which I really enjoyed, especially in my youth, is that Morihei Shiba, he would talk a lot about a person's mission. I think one of my favorite quotes from him was that uh, that each individual has his mission and each family has his mission and each country has its mission. Like there's, you know, an inherent quality of your purpose, your calling that you need to fulfill, which I'm kind of a bit of a believer still. Actually, I'll make a video about that later. Now that I thought about it, it's going to be a great video. <laughs> but, uh, so he would have that belief and he would encourage people to kind of seek their purpose. And he would say that Aikido is not the path, Aikido is a tool to walk your path, which I think is a great philosophy that acknowledgement or that idea that you do have a purpose. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with. A lot of people feel purposeless. You know, they feel like 
they don't belong or they don't have a reason to be. But I personally think we all have a reason to be. Even if, you know, even if you're, the purpose may differ, it doesn't mean we all have to go save the world and be you know, huge. Maybe your purpose is to clean up you know, this environment around you and you will enjoy it and you'll make the, better, better, the world better because of it. So I do feel like we have that calling in. And I resonated with Aikido's founder when he said that. And he wanted to make Aikido a vehicle for that. Again, it's just, I think it failed. But if we look at the essence of that philosophy and kind of summarize what it's about, you know, that real realization that we're all in the same mess, we're all here together, you know, that, that we do have this connection, we're all interrelated and kind of makes sense even in a scientific way. Because, you know, like if you look at the economy in the world today, like everything is so connected. If somebody suffers, some country suffers, everyone basically suffers. Not yet to 100% degree, but the further we go, the more connected we are. And, you know, if, if like that's what we're seeing with the pandemic right now, um, that's what we're forced to face is how we, we are, how, we, how much we need each other and how much we support each other and rely on each other. And when that falls apart, we have, we're struggling. So we are connected actually in the most literal way. And then also, you know, in this kind of deeper mystical way, I don't want to stress that too much, but it's a nice notion to, to believe in. I actually, I'll check, I, I feel like my, my camera's running out of my battery, but hopefully I'll make this through. So yeah, so you know that, that everybody is somebody's brother. Everybody's somebody's, you know, mother, father, child. And if the person is acting like shit, you don't have to, you know, hurting him is maybe not the best way. If you can do something about it and, and support him and kind of, you know, be there for that person, like in that story in the train and, and come from that person's perspective and relate to him and, and realize, you know what, I, I could, I might as well be you, you know, in other conditions, I could be you. And then you kind of come to that sense that we're all one family and we have to work for each other and we have to care for each other. And so that's, that's kind of essentially the Aikido philosophy and to embody that philosophy, to live that, I think it's a beautiful direction. And it would be so amazing if Aikido would be able, you know, to do that on a grand scale. Unfortunately, it doesn't. I'm a strong believer it doesn't. I wish it would. I guess, I don't know if it's better than nothing. I guess it's better than nothing. You know, it's being spoken about. But, you know, words are not enough. Thoughts and ideas are not enough. Again, that notion of war and pacifist. You, know, you have to, I think, to a degree, if you want to embody the philosophy of Aikido, you have to be a badass. It's a warrior culture. It's a path of a warrior. So you do need to be extremely powerful, aim for that, and then choose to go out there and make the world better. That's something I still believe in today, and that's what I, I, I want to fight for myself now that I think of it. It's kind of almost a realization moment for me. I'm like, holy crap. There's part of Aikido which I do enjoy still, besides all the shit. So yeah, what would happen if we would be able to take that idea, that philosophy of Aikido, and make it realistic? That would be pretty cool. And I don't want to be like delusion and be like, oh, you know, you can be an almighty warrior and, you know, go out there and, and uh, kind of uh, end violence without violence. I do think, you know, violence sometimes is necessary not all about peace, 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 but to add that at least a little bit to our lives, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So as always, I could talk more and you know, it's an endless subject. Maybe we'll come back to it. I think it's, it's a good one to look at. But all of that said, I hope for this kind of a bit of a messy jumping around and whole narrative, you have a better understanding of where Aikido comes from and what Aikido aims to be and why most probably it fails but also how potentially we could take a bit of that and add it to our lives. And, and you know what, now that I'm talking about that, maybe that's the video and direction I should look at, you know, given my all experience in the past, maybe I should look at that philosophy of, you know, maybe kind of how to live the Aikido philosophy more in my life and give some examples, how it could be embodied, not just being spoken about theoretically and you do, you know, you theoretically have one notion and then physically do completely something else. You know, walk the talk. 
it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting direction. Maybe we'll go look into it. And if you want to look into it more, let me know in the comments. Until then, keep questioning. Thank you.